I just did my own intro. Okay, hello, I'm Martin. This is Tef. Tef's actually been flying with me. Um, was it fun? Uh, a lot of fun. Yeah, okay. Scary as well. Okay. So, this, uh, this is a talk about flying for free, um, hacking the atmosphere, you could think of it as as well. Um, the photo here is taken from a glider about uh, two kilometers up above the clouds, as you can see. Um, we're actually climbing at two meters per second. We don't have an engine. Uh, we started from about 300 meters. We went about 150 kilometers on this flight, and all the energy we used for that we stole from the atmosphere. So that's what this talk is about. Um, you could, yeah, say, think of this as hacking the atmosphere. Uh, birds have been doing this for millions of years. In fact, in fact, this hack is so old, the dinosaurs were doing this, the pterosaurs. Um, we've been doing it since about the 20s or 30s, and now in the last couple of years, we've got unmanned aerial vehicles which are autonomously doing this by themselves. Uh, and what we're doing is exploiting moving air in the atmosphere uh, in order to climb and to travel distances. Um, in English, we call that soaring. Um, in German, you have Siegelflug, I think, sail sailing flight, which is quite a nice term for it, I think. Um, some figures, flights to over 50,000 feet, that's 15 kilometers up, uh, done by Steve Fossett a few years ago before he died. Um, distances over 3,000 kilometers, um, again recently. But um, is that stopping the video? Okay, right, okay. Um, There's a lot of aerodynamics involved, there's a lot of factors that go into the design of the aircraft to make them optimal for doing this, but in terms of actually flying them, it's an information problem. Um, we need to work out where the lift is, where we need to go, how to optimize our flight, and there's a whole load of data analysis that comes into doing that, modeling what the atmosphere is doing, predicting it. And increasingly, we're doing that not just in our heads, but with the help of electronics and software, both on board the aircraft and on the ground. Um, so it's an interesting technical problem, which is why I thought you guys might be interested. And it's also a hell of a lot of fun, and it's cheaper than you might think. Um, to learn to fly on gliders is really a fraction of the cost of doing it on powered aircraft, and you can also pick up old ones very cheap. You can own your aircraft for less than 1,500 euros. Um, I can confirm that with some I saw advertised just before I left. Um, so these are some of the aircraft that, uh, that do this. Um, so the birds have been doing this for a long time. You've got older sailplanes like this, which are wooden construction. More modern ones are fiberglass and uh, plastic, carbon fiber, some of them. Since then, people try to make simpler things, hand gliders, power gliders. They don't perform quite as well, but they're cheap, and I guess some people like them. Um, this aircraft here, it's fairly typical of a large uh, remote-controlled model glider, uh, but this particular one is actually autonomous. It's a UAV, and uh, that's Dan Edwards there who's uh, working on that at North Carolina State University. So to get these things in the air without an engine, uh, a few ways to do it, either tow them up behind a, another aircraft, um, or just accelerate them to flying speed by attaching them to a cable, hauled in by a winch on the ground. You go quite steep to about uh, 300, 600 meters. Um, you can also just go off the top of a hill, either on foot, a hand glider, or a power glider, or bungee launches for large gliders like these, where basically just very large elastic band. And then once we get up there, 
the main thing that we're trying to do is to exploit air in the atmosphere that is rising. Um, we know that the atmosphere, there's air moving horizontally, that's the wind, but there's also a lot of vertical movement and that's what we're primarily exploiting, or there's things we can do with the wind as well. So any, any glider has a sink rate that is maybe one or two meters per second. Um, so flying through still air, there probably isn't any vertical movement in here, it's coming down at one meters per second, but if it came into some air that was rising at say two meters per second, you add those and we're actually going to be climbing relative to the ground at one meter per second. Unfortunately, what goes up must come down somewhere else, and on average, all the vertical movement in the atmosphere has to add up to zero. So you'd think that that would cancel out and we'd end up with the same descending glide angle already, but if we can figure out where the lift is and fly in such a way that we spend more time there than in the sink, then we can actually gain even though the average is zero. Now where that lift comes from uh, can be a whole range of sources. There's three main ones. Uh, the simplest one to understand is just hill lift, where you've got the wind blowing onto a slope, the air is forced to rise up, the air above that is forced to rise above that as well, so it knocks on further up into the atmosphere. Uh, this is where you see power gliders, hand gliders, uh, especially flying near hills because it's very strong lift. Thermals, which are bubbles of warm air that have been heated near the ground and then they're floating up through the atmosphere because they've got a higher temperature and so a lower density than the air around them. Uh, most people, quite a few people are aware of this anyway. The one that people don't know so much about is uh, WAVE, which is actually pretty much the most exciting. Um, so this is, this is a very large scale effect that happens after air is blown over hills or mountains. And it's gone over the mountain, it's had to rise a bit and come down the other side, and it gets very turbulent in, the, in what we call the lee, the downwind side of the hills. And uh, this sort of forces the air to ride over that turbulence. And uh, you often get this oscillation set up. And these waves can propagate a long way downwind and a long way up as well. And that's where the, the really high altitude flights come from and also some of the really high speeds and high distances. So combining these different areas of lift uh, from various sources, we can travel distances by just climbing in one area of lift, moving to another, descending as we go, but then climbing again, and you can extend this, and we routinely do for hundreds of kilometers, and sometimes thousands. Um, now just staying up and wandering around wherever the nearest lift is, is relatively easy. Going in a particular direction is harder, so as a challenge we set these tasks, uh, basically a sequence of waypoints, start here, try and fly to here, here, and here, and on this one, uh, as well as the straight lines that indicate the sort of task that's been set, the uh, coloured line is indicating the, the flight path uh, I actually took on this flight, uh, and you can see where we've We've been circling in uh, thermals and drifting with the wind and then working across wind to come back and then into wind coming home. What do the colours indicate? The colours here are mapped to the altitude. So you can see here that we're climbing going from green to blue and then we descend again and climb again. I'll show you this one in 3D in a minute. So this leads to this what I think is that, you know, the heart of the problem here uh, is this sort of optimization uh, situation where we, we are here and we want to get to some other point in the atmosphere without touching the ground in between um, through a time varying 3D vector field that we don't actually know any of the values of. Um, well, we know the value at our current position because we can work out whether we're climbing or descending, and we know the values just behind us, and still doesn't give us an awful lot to go on. So in order to do this effectively, we need to understand what the patterns out there are. So basically it turns out that our atmosphere is a really, really bad random number generator, and it's got loads of pattern vulnerabilities that you can find and exploit. <laughs> so this is, you know, to give you a sort of 
visual impression of what that's about. This is uh, part of a simulation uh, from a weather model. It's about 50 kilometers aside, showing thermal bubbles uh, in an area. And so we're trying to go from completely transparent air that we can see out there to a mental picture or a software picture of, you know, where is this lift? What does it look like? How can I go from one bit of it to another? And so to do all this, we need to understand the weather that actually gives us a lift. A bit of video just to you know, help pitch what this is about. This is uh, our glider just taking off on a winch launch. It's me waving it goodbye. Um, quite a steep climb. This, uh, this aircraft is worth about 2,000 euros. That's the winch hauling the cable in. And then as you rise up over the winch, just release the cable. Turn away. This is over an airfield in Scotland called Port Moak, which is where I fly from most of the time. And uh, we're quite fortunate we have this nice big hill that uh, almost any wind direction we can get some lift off that. Basically, just by flying along near it like that and working our way upwards from there. And you can actually see how much the air is rising, um, the glider's climbing in that turn. You can actually do quite a lot of uh, cross-country flying in certain areas just by purely hill lift. Um, just working along ridges, get some height, jump over to another one. Uh, the, the Lake District in the UK is particularly good for this. Aerotow launching, just stay behind the tug. This is a, a glider thermaling, so it's circling, trying to stay tightly in an area of lift, a bubble, that's maybe a uh, Four or five hundred meters wide. That's that's yeah. That's me doing it. And uh, just coming up. Yeah, there's a few few down there somewhere in southern England. This is a variometer. It's an instrument basically telling you that you're going up or you're going down. There's three other gliders in the thermal above us, and you can do that right up to the, the base of the the clouds, and then to get above that. Um, often this is involving waves, so this is actually a view from in the wave at about, looks like about 12,000 feet maybe, um, so what, f three, four kilometres, and you can actually see the waves in the shape of the clouds there. It's going up, down, up, down, across there. So. Um, a little bit about the performance of these aircraft. Um, so you may have learned in school the classic force diagram with lift, drag, weight and thrust. We don't have the thrust, so the forces have to balance out this way, and that's why when you fly a glider, it will come down at an angle. And you can see that that angle actually comes from the ratio between the lift and the drag. So these things were coming down at, what, three, four to one, something like that maybe? And that determines your glide range as a ratio of the start height. So that's three or four for a paper plane. We regularly get 30 to 50. That means we can start from one kilometre, fly for 30 kilometres. Um, the record's at 72, that's this aircraft here called the ETA, uh, 30 metre wingspan, aspect ratio of the wings is over 50, uh, very long, very thin, very flexible, you actually see this thing pull up and it goes like that. Um, hand gliders are catching up, power gliders basically won't. Um, it's not the only uh, aspect of performance, because we're also interested in how slowly can we get the thing to come down, because if we're in lift, uh, our, the rate of our climb is the rate the air is going up minus our sink rate, so that determines the minimum lift we can use. We need to be manoeuvrable to stay in a tight area of lift, that isn't, it takes blooming ages to make those wings turn. Um, and uh, we're also interested in the relationship of both the lift and drag to the speed. As I say, if you want performance on a budget, um, the nice thing about gliders as opposed to hang gliders and power gliders, which have a relatively limited lifespan, is these just last for decades. There's no engines, there's hardly any moving parts. So this one is designed in 1966. This particular one that we have is actually built out of spare parts of a couple of different ones. There's the figures. Glide ratio 33, fly for a kilometre from a half from a wingspan or so. Um, it'll come down at 
0.7 meters per second at uh, the minimum sink speed. And you can fly it up to 250 kilometers an hour. You have to kind of point at the ground a bit to do it, but it's good fun. It'll loop, it'll roll, it'll do all that good stuff. Um, older ones than that, you even get free. People haven't got time to look after them. So a little more about the performance. Um, as I say, the, the lift and the drag are both related to the, the airspeed. So as you fly the aircraft faster by diving a bit or bring the stick back and fly slower, you change those and you change the sink rate. And if you plot that, you get these polar curves, we call them, that are characteristic uh, to the particular type of aircraft and things like how much load it's carrying and uh, whether it's flaps are down or, or that sort of thing. And uh, this gets involved in lots of calculations for working out what the optimal speed to fly is. So in, in still air, to get the, the best glide the furthest distance from a given starting height, if you take a tangent from the origin here and plot it to where that meets that curve, that gives you the, the best glide speed. And uh, if you're in lift or you're in sync or you've got headwind or tailwind or you've got ballast on board, um, these all shift that around and you get different optimal speeds. But half of it depends on what lift you expect to find when you get to the next climb. Um, so optimising this is all a bit complicated. Instruments we carry on board these things, uh, that's the panel kit out in our, our glider. Uh, so altimeter, airspeed. There's two Varios here, one electric, one mechanical. The electric one, uh, the main advantage of that is it's got an audio feed out, so beep, 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 you're going up and do 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 no, we're going down. Um, extra bits, artificial eyes and so on. Um, radio is quite common. We fly with a parachute, just in case, never used one. Uh, we have oxygen on board for wave flying, because you get above about uh, th three kilometres, you start to need it. Um, GPS, increasingly present. Flight loggers uh, keep a record of your, your flight. You can do this on the PDA, but the official ones are tamper-proof black boxes that give you a cryptographically signed copy of your, your, what you did, and that's used for scoring competitions. Um, but this is the really interesting thing that's just appeared in the last few years, is getting a PDA in the cockpit. And uh, a little bit of flight logging there. So this is um, the same task I was showing you earlier, the, the triangle, um, that you saw the 2D trace of. This is in 3D. Um, this has come out of the flight logger. And uh, so you can, you can see we found a thermal. We're climbing. Come on, more. That's enough. We'll go over here. And that's how it works. And uh, when you do a competition and you get maybe 30 or 40 aircraft all trying to fly the same task, you, you get this great bit the next day where you put all these traces together and you have what we call a maggot race where you, you know, watch these things go around and try and... And it's interesting because you get to look at which pilot did better and it's all strategic decisions. You know, it, it's all effectively algorithmic. You know, who's, who's got the best algorithm for navigating and finding the best lift? And consistently the same pilots come out on top. It's not just luck. Uh, the software running on these PDAs is all specialised stuff. There's been uh, commercial products for this for some years. They're pretty much getting over to, over, overtaken now by this one uh, open source project, XCSaw. Uh, it's GPL, it's written in Microsoft stuff because Microsoft owned the PDA market, unfortunately. Um, but uh, it gives you this sort of view. Again, this is uh, it's actually replaying data from that task, so that's turning the same same corner at the first first leg. And this is telling me where the restricted airspace is, all the navigation information, the task, uh, all sorts of numbers I might want to know, how much more height I've got to gain in order to be able to fly around the rest of the task, the dotted line for how far I can get to if I want to land, various airfields I could land at and what height I'd get to the map from here. It's really bringing down the workload and increasing the access to information to the pilot. The rest of the technology that gets involved is on the ground and is basically about weather forecasting. Um, so this is basically all the old traditional ways of getting weather forecast information for soaring. Now we need to predict the, what the weather's going to do because that helps us decide, do we want to go flying today at all? Is it worth it? If so, where should we go? Um, what lift can we expect when we get there? How can we plan our flight? And so probably the first thing we look at on a given day is the synoptic chart like this. This is a 
pressure map on a large scale. We've got the whole of Western Europe here um, showing us. And what the pressure is doing tells us what the wind is going to be doing. Uh, here it's going to be flowing around the isobars like this. Um, and these are fronts which are going to bring rain and stuff. So that tells you roughly what the air mass you're dealing with, what's going on is. Um, this is a sounding. This is data from a weather balloon that's been sent up, taking a cross-section through the atmosphere, temperature, pressure, humidity, that sort of thing. And uh, using this data, you can predict with reasonable accuracy you know, what the thermals are going to do, what the trigger temperature needs to be, how hot it has to get for the, the thermal to start, how high the thermal is going to go, where the cloud base is going to be, uh, how strong the lift is, that sort of thing. Uh, and then closer to the, the time, probably on the actual day of your flight, you can look at the satellite picture. It's going to tell you, you know, here we can actually see some wave on this. And uh, rainfall radar tells you where the rain is, and if, if that's coming towards you, you might want to you know, fly to avoid it, go somewhere else. This all takes quite a lot of skill and experience to figure out what it means for the actual day in question. And it's all a bit big, low resolution. I mean, you've got the whole of Western Europe here. Um, you've got higher resolution on this, but it's not what we're interested in. These soundings, there's 15 of them, I think, taken daily in the, in the UK. So that's to cover the whole country. So what's exciting, again, just very recently, um, is that we're now getting much higher resolution models, um, which you can actually just run yourself. So this is uh, a program called RASP. It's basically a Perl script tying together a bunch of code that's come out of academia and uh, various uh, bits of freely available data. Uh, you can run these models on a Linux PC in a few hours at resolutions down to about a kilometer. Um, and what you're doing there is you seed it with information again from those soundings and uh, global forecast data as well and other observations. And so you get an initial estimated 3D state of the atmosphere over the whole area you're interested in forecasting for. And then the program cranks through all the fluid dynamics, the equations of motion to work out what would actually happen. And by the time you've run that for some time steps, it reaches an equilibrium that pretty well, it seems, matches what actually happens. And then we can go and extract all the interesting parameters we actually want, like how strong are the thermals um, that we actually want to know to fly. Um, and the data that's coming out of this, uh, it, it, it's getting better and better, and it's pretty much revolutionizing some, some aspects of soaring. Uh, and as I say, at the moment, three to four hours to run this, but as the computational power goes up, what we're going to be able to do with this sort of stuff is going to get more exciting. Um, all of this, you can get all the info on it and download it from uh, the address there. Um, and it'll give you rain, it'll give you sun on the ground, wind speed, all the things that you're interested in, even if you're not a glider pilot. So, thermals, a little more about them. Um, it's all come from solar heating, but the uh, sun doesn't really heat the air very much by itself. Uh, what it does is it heats the ground. The heat just goes straight through the air. Uh, and then the air that's sitting near the ground is what actually heats up. And so you, you get a sort of bubble of air near the ground, and that wants to go up, um, but it's kind of lazy and it just sort of sits there until something actually gives it a bit of a push. And then once it's actually going, um, if the temperature and pressure profile in the air is right for it to keep going up, then it, it will. And again, you can predict that from the sounding information. And the bubble will separate and rise. And once, as it rises, it, the pressure decreases, it expands, and it cools. And once it gets cold enough, which will happen at a given layer that we call the cloud base, then the water vapour in it is going to condense and form a cloud, which is great because it says, look, there's a thermal here. Unfortunately, what it really says is, look, there's a thermal here that's almost finished. You want it to be back over there, but we'll come back to that. Well, this, is a, this is a time-lapse video uh, in which you can actually see this sort of thermal development happening. Um, so each one of these cumulus clouds, there's some paragliders up playing with them there, uh, is, is marking a thermal. Here's one 
you can see the, the, the thermal has just hit the cloud base and it's gone boom and it's formed that, that, that cloud. And the energy in these things is incredible. I mean, this is thousands and thousands of tons of air churning around. There's a huge, huge amount of energy in there to be tapped. They could go quite high. Uh, this is Norway last year. Uh, we were quite lucky with this trip. We arrived on the hottest June day they'd ever had, and the thermals went up to just over three kilometres. And to find these, uh, we're largely relying on visual information. So the cloud's the most obvious one, but there isn't always a cloud, and the cloud doesn't necessarily mark where the, the thermal's starting. But it's, uh, it's a pretty good bet, so you see a cloud, go under it, you're going to get some lift. So we spend a lot of time just going from cloud to cloud. If we don't have a cloud, or if we're lower down, and uh, the, the clouds are marking where the thermals were, but not now, um, then we're looking for the points on the ground that are actually triggering the thermals. So this might be areas that heat up more because they've got a different surface, like a town with lots of tarmac and concrete. Um, or it might be uh, if there's a wind and you've got some warm air that's blown across the, the ground and then it meets something cold like a lake and then it, that starts it going up. Or it hits a hill and that starts it going up. And you often get the same thing, the same trigger point on the ground will trigger one thermal after another and so you get a line of them in the sky and you can work your way along that line uh, with a being in lift pretty much all the way. You can also see what the birds are doing. If there's a thermal, if there's a bird flying around, go join him, he's probably right. If you find one, he'll come and join you, they're, they're quite good at that. They're not stupid. Um, <laughs> Same for other gliders. Um, and if you're completely stuck, you can just fly a blind search. Find a straight line or a search pattern and uh, wait till you find some lift and try and centre in it. But this uh, picture here is a very, very, very obvious thermal trigger. It's a four gigawatt power station. Um, <laughs> and that's uh, staring down the chimneys of it. But most of the energy you know, going up in this thermal is not coming from the power station. It's, coming, it, 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 it's air that's warmed up sitting on top of all this concrete and stuff, and in the surrounding area as well. Um, but the updraft from this is allowing it to suck it up and bring cold air in underneath. Uh, very often you go over that power station and the conditions aren't right for thermal to rise, you won't get any lift at all. It's not, it's not just the power station feeling that. That is, uh, no, that's Drax. Um, so, having found one of these, you need to try and get in the strongest part of the lift. You're somewhere in the bubble. The middle is going to be strongest because what it's really doing is it, it's going like that. It's almost like a mushroom cloud churning outwards and the middle is the strongest. Um, and so you're in the lift, you're flying around in circles and uh, somewhere there's the strongest part of this and you want to get as close as possible to that. So it's actually a classic hill climbing problem with all the attendant uh, problems of finding local maxima when the core of the thermal is actually over there. Um, and so, again, you need to have some sort of mental or software model of what the lift actually looks like. This diagram here is actually from uh, Dan Edwards, who's doing the autonomous soaring stuff, and he's using a simple Gaussian distribution for the lift, assuming that's what the lift is, and then flying matching his observations of what the lift he's finding on the path is and then fitting that model to his observations and working out, okay, the core is over there, I'm going to go over there and climb. Um, so yeah, uh, NASA did this project in 2005. This is, uh, again, autonomous soaring uh, UAV. It's, uh, this one was the first one to sort of demonstrate that, yes, you could do this, it just fly in a straight line, there's some lift, okay, let's assume it's a thermal, let's try and center in it, and they get you know, a few hundred meters climb out of it. Um, and now th this guy, Dan Edwards, is, is doing, uh, taking this further, and he's starting to do cross-country flights. So in October, uh, he did this 97-kilometer uh, flight that's, uh, I think, beat a record or two. 
Um, and here's a, 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 a flight trace from it. It's just flown in a straight line. It's found some lift here. It didn't think it was good enough. It's found some more here. It's tried to centre in that. And it's wandered into another one and tried to centre in that. I don't think it's doing that well, actually. You want to be turning around here, turning around here. Those are very clearly the, the cores there. It's all, uh, it's all moving downwind as well, because the bubble follows the wind. Um, these are both very well documented. Uh, the NASA one, there's a paper on it that you can download there. Uh, tells you pretty much every, everything you want to know if you want to build one of these. Um, any paparazzi guys in the room? Um, Dan Edwards has a, a site there. Uh, hill lift, I said a bit about it already. Um, the thing to bear in mind is it has a, a knock-on effect going upwards, so the lift can work for, for a long way above the hilltop height. Uh, on this, this hill here, Port Moak, we routinely get to a couple of thousand feet above, above the actual top of the hill, uh, which is then enough to go you know, off to another hill somewhere else or whatever. Um, very, very predictable. Again, if you want to do this autonomously, all you need to do is have a, a terrain height map and to know what the wind speed is. And if you want to know what the wind speed is, just fly in a circle and watch the GPS drift. You don't need big hills. The Dutch have basically no hills. It hasn't stopped them. They just do it on the sand dunes on the beach. This is the good stuff. Um, it doesn't happen everywhere, it doesn't happen all that often, but when it is good, it is very, very good. Um, it goes high. Uh, three to six kilometres, that's you know, 10 to 20,000 feet, is common routine at some sites. Um, 15 kilometres, let's say the 50,000 foot record from Steve Fawcett, that was over the Andes in, in Argentina, um, is it, possible. Uh, and it, you know, it goes a long way downwind. Um, you can see it because where the air rises, just like with a the thermal, the moisture in it condenses and it forms a cloud. Uh, and then as that air comes down, that cloud breaks up as the, the moisture evaporates again. Um, so you get this, this line of cloud that's actually laid out perpendicular to the wind. You can see them on the satellite picture. Here the wind is coming this way and the wave bars show up as ripples. And to exploit it you just stay in the upwind part and stay the hell out of the downwind part because it is going down just as fast. This can easily be a thousand feet per minute or more. Again, time lapse. This really illustrating the fact that the pattern is stationary. The air is moving through it very quickly. The wind speed at altitude is actually very high. And so although the cloud appears stationary, if you take a still photo of it, um, it's actually continually forming on one side, breaking off on the other side. And you want to you be about here. And you at which point you call your friend who's in the office and he hates you. As, yeah, that's, that's over Scotland. Um, you get these very complicated systems of um, you know, one set of waves that's happening at one frequency and wavelength at one altitude, and another one that's going in a different direction at another altitude, and you have to try and jump from one to the other by waiting until they cross over and getting a climb. Um, or if you want to fly upwind or downwind, you've got to jump from one bar to another and go through that sink, which is where you know, getting, getting a good glide angle even at high speed is, is important. Um, again, stacks of wave. This, this is getting up to something like 19,000 feet over Scotland. And it, it very often sets up in the evening once the thermals have stopped and uh, so the, the ground heating has gone and they're not churning up the atmosphere anymore because you want quite a, a smooth, smooth air for this. And uh, so we often get these lovely sunsets up there amongst the wave bars. Now, I mentioned these high resolution forecasts. This is, to me, the most exciting thing that has come out of those, is 
We now have the resolution to see individual wave bars on the forecast. Uh, this is a four kilometer resolution uh, plot from, from the RASP program uh, for the Sierra Nevada. Um, that's just over 200 kilometers that way, and you know, so probably 600 down there. And uh, this is a cross section through the air at uh, 500 millibars, so something like 15, 20,000 feet. Um, and it's showing the vertical velocity of the air. And so the red bits are going up, and, and the yellow bits not so much, and the green bits are, and blue bits are going down. And so it's taken its atmospheric state, that it, and it's run it over its whole model that includes a high resolution picture of the mountains and so on, and it said, right, it's going to do this. And sure enough, there's a satellite picture from the same day. And the agreement between these is incredible. Um, you could have sent your UAV up and said, look, fly there. And there's the wave bar. Um, now, there's one guy uh, who flies from the same side of us at Port Moat called John Williams, who's absolutely crazy, basically. Um, and uh, he's been sort of pushing the limits of uh, what you can do with uh, wave flying in Scotland. Um, and uh, he's been making a lot, a lot of use of this, and he does a lot of wave flying, and he's found that this model really agrees with what he found. And so he said, well, let's take it outside the conditions we've tested. So he set himself a task with a turn point on an oil rig 20 kilometers off the coast. And he looked at the forecast and said, yep, the model says the wave bar carries out that far. And he went out 20 kilometers off the coast and round the oil rig and flew back. I don't have the photo, unfortunately, because it's not on the web. Um, but, yeah. So, that's kind of where we are. Um, we're still pushing the aerodynamics, we're still making the airplanes better, they're getting more expensive in the process as we're having to use fancy materials and all sorts. This means the old ones are getting cheaper and what was the hot shit yesterday is now cheap. Um, but fundamentally most of what we're doing is about information and so greater achievements are going to come from better information. So. The things I see happening uh, that are going to be most interesting is just getting more and more weather data um, from more and more sensing. If you can put sensors on every aircraft in the sky, maybe, if you can do it cheap enough, you can get away doing it, um, or even just all the gliders, uh, then rather than just 15 sounding balloons from various places over the country, you've got a whole load of uh, samples through various tracks through the atmosphere uh, with which to improve that state for the models. Um, obviously, you know, we're going to get more cores, we're going to get faster clocks, well, maybe not going to get faster clocks anymore, but um, what currently takes us a few hours to run our desktop machine was either going to be running on the PDA or in a, at least in a larger box in the back of the cockpit or just run it on the ground getting into near real time and uh, transmit the data up to the, up to the gliders. The UAV stuff is interesting because there's the potential to fly much smaller aircraft um, with greater maneuverability that can do things with areas of lift that are basically too small or too complex for us to exploit with anything that's built big enough to carry a person. Um, but uh, so we may have things to learn from them. Um, they've certainly got things to learn from us because right now they can't look out there and say, right, there's a cloud. I'm going to go to that thermal. But no doubt that will happen as the computational power to, to do the vi machine vision for that um, gets easier to put onto the aircraft. But uh, unfortunately, as with a lot of things, our biggest challenge at the moment is political. Uh, the you know, in increasing regulation, increasing costs of uh, certification of aircraft and so on is making things awkward and the amount of airspace that uh, commercial air traffic is demanding uh, and more and more regional airports opening up and expanding is reducing the amount of sky that we can use basically. So if this strikes you as something interesting I really encourage you to try it while you, while you still can because it, sometimes it seems like it, it's going get, to get killed off. Um, if you do want to try it, um, the way it works is you, you have a 
flying club in an area that generally has a, an airfield and owns some of its own aircraft, including some that are used for training, and they'll, they'll have some, uh, some instructors to teach you in those. Um, the best way I could figure to, to give everyone a useful link, this is the, the links at the FAI, which is the international body for, for all air sports, um, to national gliding and also hang gliding and paragliding federations. Um, find your national one and they'll have a list of clubs, you can find one close to you. Um, you join up, you go through basic training up to, up to going solo, just learning to fly the aircraft, take off, land, all the usual. Um, it's possible to get up to solo standard, at least in the UK, for 500 to 1,000 pounds, depending on whether you can get a cheap deal if you're in a university, a lot of universities have clubs, that sort of thing. Well, I've certainly seen so 1,000 pound fixed price to solo, a pound equals a euro pretty much at the moment, which is painful but true. Um, most people take about 40 or 50 flights to go solo. A lot of those are two-minute flights just to deal with things like launch failures. And even before you get to, to that standard, there's plenty of opportunity to do all this interesting flying. There's no need for you to be a solo pilot to go and up in a two-seater and do all this cross-country cross flying. Um, but when you do want to do that, you just take some, some further... It's an adventure, because taking off without an engine, you never quite know where you're going to land up. Um, you always plan to come back to one airfield or another, but sometimes you get it wrong and you just have to pick a field and, and land. So then you get to meet the locals, who are always very interested to see you know, who's this guy who's just come and landed in our back garden. Um, I think this is some British you know, aristocrat's uh, back garden up here, somewhere in Scotland. And then you have all the fun of trying to get the, the trailer out to the where, where the glider is, which can be awkward country roads, and take it to bits and uh, put it away, take it home, try again tomorrow. <laughs> that, was, that was my worst. <laughs> um, it wasn't even my glider, I borrowed it. <laughs> and... Uh, it, it's a wooden one, it's covered in fabric, and the fabric's doped, so the cows love to lick it. <laughs> well, I landed here, and there was, there was absolutely no human being in sight. It was clear, right to the horizon. I just shouted, help, as loud as I could, and, and, and no one came. And I was running around and around this thing in circles, trying to stop cow, about 30 cows from trampling all over the wings. And uh, eventually, you know, got the crew out and got it back and spent the whole next morning wiping uh, cow saliva off it. Um, I've got a few minutes so you get some bonus stuff. Um, this is really interesting stuff that's just happened in the last couple of years. This is 2006. Uh, the problem with gliding as a, as a spectator sport is that it's really boring. Um, you get to watch the aircraft all take off and then they come back a few hours later and that, that's it. So we've been trying to improve that with um, uh, Grand Prix style races where the scoring is simple, everyone starts at the same time. And uh, they threw a whole load of money into this. They did this in New Zealand which is pretty much the best gliding anywhere. And, uh, they had a chase helicopter, they did live tracking of all the aircraft, they got the same people on board who did the uh, animation and stuff for the sailing races. And uh, yeah, it was absolutely awesome. You can get the, the, whole, uh, the whole thing on a DVD called Gladiators of the Sky. Um, <laughs> but, so, that, that's just a clip I've taken out of it, but uh, it, it, it's really worth a watch. Um, and uh, yeah. Um, yeah, I mentioned crazy stuff that uh, you can do at smaller scales. Um, so this is uh, dynamic soaring, which is a different way of, uh, of, of getting energy out of the atmosphere. Um, so there doesn't need to be any rising air, there just needs to be a, a difference in wind speed. Um, and we, we, we pretty much learnt this one off the albatross here, because uh, they're quite good at it, they do it all the time. So what's going on here is you've got uh, wind that's changing with height, usually the wind gets stronger with height, and uh, so a, 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 they do this over the ocean, so you've got some waves that are blown up, and then the wind's blowing over the waves, and behind the waves, the, you're in the shadow from the wind, and uh, the wind's a bit less. So what you can actually do here is, if you're flying in the, the slow air behind the wave, and then you suddenly climb up into the, the faster air, you've gained airspeed. As you've gained airspeed, you've got more lift, so you can pull up, change that, 
kinetic energy you've built up against the, the, the wind into height that gives you potential energy. When you can turn around, dive back into the slow air, you, you suddenly you know, gain ground speed doing that, turn, come up, and repeat this. And they can go across the wind like this, they can stay in the same place, they can go between waves and go downwind. And we, there's been a, like, a tiny number of flights where, in really weird conditions, where like full scale gliders have been able to do this. Um, not right near the sea, but sort of different you know, wind shear conditions. But um, model gliders um, have now got really good at it, at doing it behind hills like this. Um, so the, these are completely unpowered, um, just things about th this big. And they're, they're, this is the back side of the hill, the wind's coming from this side, and uh, it's gone over the hill, and so the wind's strong up there and weak down here, and they're just, they're just doing the same thing. And uh, the speeds they get into these things with these things are incredible. There's a, there's a record at 440 kilometers an hour now. Um, and, you know, all the energy is, is, is free. You know, all you can do is just fly off the, off, the, off the hill and you can do this. Uh, this is real time. Yeah. Yeah. So, well, yeah, we've still got a lot to learn. There you go. That's it. Questions? Is there any way to get uh, up in the jet stream? Uh? Steve Fawcett was working on this um, <laughs> b before he died. Um, I, I don't know if you know the story. St Steve Fawcett is the, the guy who did the, you know, the solo round the world flights and balloon flights, and, and then he crashed in a, a little Cessna or something a, a few months ago. It took a long time to find him. But he had this uh, project called the, the Perlam Project. And uh, they were trying to break the, the glider world out, the altitude record by you know, using these sort of jet stream and very high altitude wave effects. They're trying it over New Zealand, they're trying it over Argentina, and eventually they got this 50,000 foot height record in Argentina. But he was talking about being able to go to 100,000 feet in the jet stream with a specially designed glider. So uh, his calculations are probably good. Got that mic there. Thank you. Um, I got two questions. Um, tell us more about coming back after landing. And the second is, um, how big is the smallest glider possible? The smallest glider possible that can what, carry a human? Sorry? The smallest glider that can carry a human or? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, the smallest glider that can carry a human. Um, <laughs> Well, I mean, you can wear a, one of these wingsuit things <laughs> and you get a glide angle of one-to-one. -one. And there's, there's a great video on YouTube of someone doing this and just going down a mountain um, that is about the same angle. So it depends what angle you want to be able to come down at. If you don't mind it being that angle, then it can be this big. Um, <laughs> If you want it to be more, then you need to start putting some, some wings on there. Um, uh, to answer your other question about coming back after... Oh, okay. So, so the, the, the question is about that, handling the aircraft after landing. So um, I didn't stick a picture in, actually, because I couldn't find a good one to hand. But um, the wings come off. Um, the, the wings, you can carry them with two people. Um, so you just have the glider parked up, um, disconnect the pins, just a couple of big pins that hold the whole thing together, pull those out and uh, take the wings out and then the whole thing goes in the trailer with the fuselage in the middle and one wing on each side and the tailplane just shoved in somewhere. Um, so yeah, it, it, it takes 20 minutes or so to put one together or take it apart again. Most of them just get kept in their trailers, dismantled and, and when you want to fly them you put them together because it's cheaper than having a hangar. If you have an electrically powered plane that can glide well, is it possible to convert uh, some of the energy here, uh, you gain uh, from terminals into uh, stored electrical energy for longer flights instead of uh, just uh, speed or altitude? You could do, yeah. I mean, 
if you've already got a propeller, uh, and you've already got a, a, a motor on there, a motor can work as a generator, so if you've gained a whole load of height, you can just dive and take the energy that you get from spinning the propeller. Um, I haven't heard of anyone doing that seriously, and I, I think you know, the margins of energy that we're working with are generally quite small, so I don't know how effective that would be unless you had some really, really strong lift frequently to play with. Batteries are heavy. Well, it's interesting. I mean, uh, we fly with a you know, lead-acid battery about that big to power the electronics that we have on board, you know, GPS and loggers and all that. And uh, you know, a couple of those will last you for you know, 12-hour flight, no problem, and, and, and more. Um, Electric-powered self-launching gliders are starting to appear. John Williams, who I mentioned, actually flies the first one of those that's uh, come into the UK. Um, it's called the Antares, and it's, it's a 20-metre thing, and it's just got lithium polymer batteries in the wings, um, loads of them, and uh, a few kilowatts of uh, you know, motor, motor on it that just folds away. Um, Okay, um, yeah. Yeah. is this working? Yeah. Um, it's sometimes said that man is not made for flying, so was there sometimes moments, or how often do these moments happen that remind you of this uh, way of thinking? I mean, do you personally, or other people that you know? Um, you get up there, and you, you know, days like that, sitting up above the clouds, rubbish, we were meant to fly. <laughs> If, if, if whoever's up there well, didn't want us to go to fly, would want us to fly, wouldn't have given us brains, he wouldn't have given us vulnerabilities in this uh, random number generator. <laughs> but how, uh, how small do, do those uh, radio, free, radio controlled uh, gliders get? Um, you can make one as small as you can make, uh, I mean, people make model aircraft down to you know, tiny little scales, not usually as gliders, but you could do. But again, it's a case of glide angle. Um, I'll come back briefly to the uh, picture I had of the uh, ETA um, and it explain something about wingspans and, and glide angles. Um, the reason this has really, really long wings, um, the ideal wing goes on forever. It doesn't have an end. If you, if you test a wing in a wind tunnel, the, the ends go to the walls of the tunnel. And so there's no way for air to come off the end of the wing. It has to go over and get guided by the wing and, and down, and that's where you get the lift. Um, but in reality, we, we have to actually have an end to the wings. But the less significant you can make the, 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 the ends, and the, the more you can approximate the, the ideal infinite wing, the, the better the efficiency gets. And so for a given amount of lift you've got to generate to hold a couple of pilots up, then your, your wing loading's fixed, and, and, and to, to get close to that you have to make the wing longer and longer and thinner and thinner, and use more and more expensive materials and constructions to do it. So that, that's why you have these very high aspect ratio wings, is to keep the tips as insignificant as possible. Also the, the winglets here, um, these little bits that flip up, um, it, it is also just designed to reduce the, the effects that go on at the end that gives you the vortices off the wing because that you know all the energy you spend twirling the air around on the ends of the wings is, is is wasted its drag and you know the airliners are copying this now uh, you mentioned carrying a parachute um, wouldn't you expect by the time you realize you need it to be too low to, for it to be of actual use and are there any other emergency measures available the main scenario in which parachutes gets used is mid-air collisions um, we fly, uh, you, you saw the video earlier with you know, three gliders all close together in the same thermal. Um, in a competition you can have 20, 30 gliders all in the same thermal. We always circle in the same direction to um, make sure it's you know, easier to, to see what everyone's doing and so on. But we do spend a lot of time flying in close proximity and very rarely mid-air collisions do, ha do happen. We have to do it because the lift is in small areas. Um, so that's, that's the main time that they get used, but it is very, very rare. Um, aside from that, no, I mean, the, the glider is your means of getting down and the parachute is your, is your backup. You, you are... 
the, the question was, um, you know, other emergency measures. You are seeing on some newer aircraft um, fancier escape systems um, to, to, to get you out quicker. You know, not quite the full-on James Bond ejector seat, but um, close. Uh, and also some with parachute that you can deploy from the aircraft to recover the whole aircraft, um, slow, its, slow its descent. Um, but not, not very common as yet. One more. How about doing this in the ocean? That's an interesting question. Um, how about doing this in the ocean? Um, I don't know. Uh, the fluid, the fluid dynamics are going to be you know, the same principles, but it's a much thicker fluid. Um, so all these dimensionalist numbers that involved, get involved in the fluid dynamics, like the Reynolds number and so on, are going to be different. Um, you have, obviously, ocean currents. I don't know how much vertical movement you get in the ocean. Um, in, in theory, yes. Um, I mean, the other thing I can mention is talking about doing this in different fluids. Uh, one of the reasons NASA was doing that project is they thought it might be interesting to do this on Mars which you know, has a quite different atmosphere and less gravity, so it might, might be quite good. Mm -hmm. um, hi, I yeah, haven't talked a lot about uh, traffic control, so um, do you have a radio to communicate with others, or how do you ensure that you uh, don't, don't uh, collide, or don't you, don't, uh, go into an airspace that is uh, preserved for uh, public transport? Yeah, use a map. Um, <laughs> so an air map is you know, a normal map with all the areas of controlled airspace, danger zones, all the airfields, all, all the stuff you're interested in as an aircraft marked on it. And uh, if you're flying more than a few miles from the site that you started at, you just take a, a map and a compass. And uh, you keep track of your position, you have to navigate, that's one of the things you learn, uh, and uh, you avoid going into that airspace. Since we've got the PDAs and the moving maps, that's helped a lot. And all that software, you, you program it in with all the 3D airspace information, and it will actually warn you, it will say, look, you're one kilometer from the, the edge of this, this airspace. And uh, you say, oh, okay, thanks. And, and, or you, and uh, you know, so some of it you can call up and get permission to go into, but it's, it's a hassle because gliders present a sort of unusual situation to the flight controllers. It's like, you know, they expect something that's going to fly at this speed, at this level, and we don't do that. Um, so mostly we just stay out of controlled airspace entirely, and uh, it, it's, just, it, it's part of navigation, is, is avoiding that. So you don't have a radio? Most gliders have a radio, um, but that, so you can use that to, if you want to enter some airspace, you can, you can call the relevant you know, unit and request it. I've got time for a few more questions. Maybe uh, I think only last question. Okay. One more? Anybody? Uh, but can you, can you wait for the mic so we get the, the question on the... Hi. What was the reason for the massive increase in restricted airspace that you were saying? You said it was political. Is it mainly commercial <laughs> airlines or...? Yeah, I mean, in the UK at least, uh, the government has decided a few years ago that air transport is incredibly important and needs to be subsidised and prioritised and that the airlines can have pretty much what they want. And uh, so domestic air traffic has increased. It's you know, cheaper to fly from one part of the country to another than to take the, the train, which is crazy, but true. And so you've got lots more smaller airports in, in, in areas that weren't previously really you know, use it, using air travel um, directly. Um, opening or getting bigger and, and more traffic between them and uh, just more traffic between the bigger airport, air, airports as well and as the traffic levels increase they feel they need to you know, the other thing that's going on is they want to burn less fuel 
And so rather than you know, flying up through some controlled airspace and then through a, an established airway and uh, down to another airport that maybe isn't the optimal route, but it goes through controlled airspace that they know is not going to have anything else in it, um, they want to burn less fuel by just going you know, straight from a, a to B, or at least closer to that. And uh, that means you know, airliners over a lot more of the sky than, than they would have been before when they were concentrated into corridors. I think, so I think that's all the time we've got. Okay. Uh, so yeah. I thanks think very much for listening. Uh, thanks again to Martin. I'm sure he'll be outside to answer any other questions you might have. So thanks. <laughs>